Europe. Turkey. Tentative turnaround. Turkey's economy is on the right track. Not so its politics. After years of reckless lending and spending, Turkey's new economic team, appointed after President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's election victory in May, is putting the house in order. The central bank, which previously stoked inflation with cheap money, has raised interest rates by a whopping 31.5 percentage points since June. Prices are 62% higher than a year ago, but the monthly inflation rate has fallen from a white-hot 9.5% in July to somewhat over 3% in recent months. The Turkish lira, which lost nearly 30% against the dollar in the year's first half, continues to depreciate, but much more slowly. Things have also improved in other areas. The new interior minister, Ali Yerlikaya, has launched a belated crackdown on organised crime. The evening news features footage of police smashing in doors and pinning down suspected drug barons, arms dealers and human traffickers. Awkwardly, this has exposed Turkey's role as a magnet for crime syndicates from the Balkans to South America. Turkish democracy shows no sign of improvement. Many of Mr Erdogan's opponents are still in prison, particularly Kurds, journalists and civil society activists. But the economic reforms have won cautious plaudits abroad. So have improved relations with Greece, highlighted by Mr Erdogan's visit to Athens on December 7th. In a report in late November... The European Commission recommended opening talks with Turkey on an upgraded customs union. There are strings attached. For one thing, Turkey must first get serious about peace negotiations with Cyprus, which it partially occupies. EU leaders will discuss this during a two-day summit starting on December 14th. But the reformist current faces three big impediments. Mr Erdogan's strongman instincts, his pact with Turkey's nationalists, and his government's relationships with Russia and Hamas. Relations with America have turned frosty again since Turkey failed to live up to its pledge this summer to let Sweden into NATO. Mr Erdogan now wants an ironclad guarantee from America to sell Turkey 40 new F-16 fighter jets. He and his Justice and Development, or ARC, party may eventually give up and put Sweden's accession to a vote, possibly before Christmas. But they may also decide to keep moving the goalposts. A vote could expose cracks in Turkey's governing coalition. Mr Erdogan can count on his own party to vote as instructed, but he has no such control over his main ally – the far-right Nationalist Movement Party, or MHP. On December 8th, Devlet Bargeli, the MHP's leader, announced that his party would back Sweden's accession only once the Palestinians have a state and Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, is on trial in The Hague. That may be a while. Tensions between ARC and the MHP have already begun to come to the surface. Insiders say the war on organised crime has ruffled feathers in the MHP, which has links to some notorious mob bosses. The bloodshed in the Middle East may poison Turkey's relations with the West even further. Many Turks are seething over America's support for Israel's bombing of Gaza. In Europe and America, meanwhile, Turkey's government has come under fire for its links to Hamas. Brian Nelson, an American Treasury official who visited Istanbul last month, said he was profoundly concerned about the group's ability to raise funds in Turkey. Mr Erdogan stands by Hamas, which he calls a liberation group, rather than a terrorist organisation. A few months ago, a visit by Mr Erdogan to the White House seemed to be in the cards, but his embrace of Hamas has nixed that. The EU and America are also increasingly worried about Turkey's dealings with Russia. Western officials have pleaded with Turkey to stop turning a blind eye to companies selling Russia dual-use goods, 
which can be used to make weapons. Such exports, mostly through intermediaries in the Caucasus and Central Asia, surged to $158 million in the first nine months of 2023, compared with an average of $28 million before Russia invaded Ukraine. Turkey's economy is not yet out of the woods, but it is on the right track. After a long hiatus, foreign portfolio investors are starting to trickle back. But long-term investors will not return as long as Mr Erdogan creates new problems with the West. Politics in Turkey need to follow the economy's lead. Europe Spain Unfair play Partisanship is eroding Spain's democracy. In a well-governed country, who runs the statistical agency or the courts is not a partisan issue. But in an increasingly embittered Spain, the basic functions of government and especially trust in the judiciary are being poisoned by politics. Things are not as bad as in Poland under its just-departed populist government, but they are moving in the wrong direction. Pedro Sanchez's Socialist Party came second in July's elections, but brought together a ragbag of parties to support his return as Prime Minister. Chief among the favours offered was an amnesty to the supporters of an illegal independence referendum held in Catalonia in 2017. The amnesty bill will be challenged in the Constitutional Tribunal when it passes. But Mr Sanchez has tilted that court to a sympathetic majority by appointing two left-leaning judges, its head as a former chief prosecutor under a previous socialist government. Most observers expect the court to approve the amnesty, though parts could be struck down. Worse, for critics, is an agreement between the Socialists and Junts per Catalunya, one of the separatist parties, to set up parliamentary commissions to investigate lawfare, by which they mean the use of criminal prosecution for political ends. For Junts, it is self-evident that separatist politicians have been targets of such harassment. To many, this looks like undermining the separation of powers, with lawmakers nobbling judges and tossing out prosecutions they dislike. Speaking to foreign correspondents on December 5th, Mr Sanchez waved away that notion, saying the Lawfare Commission's findings would, of course, not be binding. He also argued that the prime example of lawfare is the kidnapping of the general counsel of the judiciary, which appoints many top judges by the centre-right opposition People's Party, or PP. After Mr Sanchez took power in 2018, the PP opportunistically called for changes in how judges are nominated and has refused to renew the council's mandate, which expired five years ago. But Mr. Sanchez has repaid his opponents in the same coin. Not only is the Constitutional Court's head and ally, but so is the country's top prosecutor. The Prime Minister has put socialist faithful in non-political jobs at the Centre for Sociological Research, which conducts opinion polling, among other duties, the National Statistical Institute and the EFA State News Agency. One minister, Felix Bolaño, a kind of fixer for Mr Sanchez, has been named Justice Minister, as well as Minister for the Presidency, the Prime Minister's right-hand man, and Minister for Relations with Parliament, a one-man symbol of the erosion of the separation of powers. Victor Lapuente, a political scientist at Gothenburg University and a columnist for El País, a newspaper, says that Mr Sanchez should hold back from actions that, while legal, infuriate many voters and undermine trust in the system. In turn, his opponents have undercut their case with inflammatory language. The leader of Vox, a party well to the right of the PP, said recently that the people will want to string Sanchez up by his feet, a fate that befell Benito Mussolini upon his execution in 1945. None of the rhetoric coming from the PP or Vox is useful, says Camino Mortera Martinez, a critic of the amnesty and of Mr Sanchez's undermining of the separation of powers. An expert on the rule of law at the Centre for European Reform, a think tank in Brussels, 
She says that Spain is by no means the sort of pariah that Poland became as it defied the EU. But some of Mr. Sanchez's steps remind her of the early days of Polish backsliding. Polarization has driven both parties to seek advantage wherever they can. As they do, Spaniards' trust in their democracy suffers. Europe. Russian TV. Gangsters of Glasnost. The hit show that both Russia and Ukraine want to ban. Ukrainians and Russians agree on very little lately, but a Russian TV series has created an unlikely connection. In both countries, audiences are lapping it up, and bureaucrats want to ban it. Slovo Patsana, or A Fella's Word, is set in the criminal underworld of perestroika era Tatarstan. By the late 1980s, the Russian Republic's street gangs were infamous. Young kids divided up the tarmac of Kazan, the regional capital, under the eyes of older criminals. Those who joined the gangs were called Patsani and had protection of sorts. Those who did not, the Chushpani, were targets of often extreme violence. Jura Khrushchevnik's eight-part series is an unsentimental take on late Soviet decay, cynicism and sadism. Its high production values and unflinching drama made it a hit almost as soon as it aired in November. In Russia, its title was the single most searched term on search engines. In Ukraine, it was not far behind. The title music, which goes unidentified in the credits because the musicians are anti-war, tops charts in both countries. Ukrainian officials worry that the series serves as Russian propaganda. It is financed by a state agency tasked with providing patriotic content. On December 7th, Ukraine's culture ministry warned citizens not to watch an unnamed Russian-made series that propagates violence. The state film agency, meanwhile, declared that public showing of the series was illegal. This had little impact on streaming, which mostly uses pirate platforms beyond the reach of regulators. If Slovopatsana is Kremlin propaganda, Russia's government seems not to know it. Russian officials rail against the series for romanticizing violence and alternative authorities. Rustam Minakhanov, the head of Tatarstan, promised to ask the Kremlin to block it. His human rights ombudsman wondered whether it was the work of foreign agents. Senators in Moscow have called for the show to be pulled from streaming platforms. The series' grimmer episodes, full of severed ears, rape and murder, make it clear it does not glorify violence. Commissioned before Russia invaded Ukraine, it is a sober examination of history. But it offers allegories to the present too, says Alexander Rodniansky, a Ukrainian-Russian film producer. The helplessness of citizens in impossible circumstances. The problem for the Ukrainian state is that series such as these normalize Russians. It shows them as living people. Europe Charlemagne Remembrance of Crimes Past How to Grieve for Millions of Victims of the Nazis, One at a Time Max Kersterich lived for a time at 204 Chaussée de Waterloo, an elegant apartment block on a hilly thoroughfare in Brussels. A married father of four sons, he probably arrived in the Belgian capital from Frankfurt in 1934, aged 50. What Kersterich did for a living is lost to time, though a previous stint working in the Dutch East Indies suggests a well-off trader of some sort. Why the family moved is also not known, but might be guessed at. For if history remembers Kersterich at all, it is as a statistic – one of six million Jews murdered by the Nazis. Three of his sons died with him at Auschwitz. Only the second one, Manfred, survived. In 1938, an opportunity came up for just one brother to emigrate to Australia, an escape from the impending horror. 
It was Manfred who drew the winning straw. Those not so lucky were rounded up, landing in French camps before being loaded onto eastbound trains. Last month, the Kersterich family returned from Australia to the Chaussee de Waterloo. Manfred died in 1984, unable or unwilling to share with his loved ones much about the circumstances of his emigration. His son, Joe Kosterich, the umlaut on the O was lost in the move down under, a medical doctor from Perth in his early 60s had made the journey with his wife Cathy and their grown children. Number 204 is a little faded these days, its entrance flanked by a dingy bar and a dental practice. One drizzly Saturday morning in November, the Kosterich family looked on as a small slab of pavement in front of the building's threshold was excised. In its place, a brass plaque the size of a cobblestone was cemented in. Here lived Max Kersterich, born 1884, it starts, before noting his grim fate. As trams rolled by and city life went on, a few short speeches were attempted to a dozen well-wishers. My grandfather until today was just another number, said Joe, unable to hold back a tear. Cathy laid down a few flowers by the plaque, a kangaroo paw and some eucalyptus, an Australian wink to the new life the tides of history had foisted upon the kersterich Kosterich clan. The man on his knees, expertly laying the brass that morning, was Gunther Demnig. Since 1996, the German artist has chipped away at pavements in around 30 countries in Europe, filling them with what he calls Stolpersteiner, or stumbling stones. Earlier this year, the 76-year-old laid the 100,000th memorial. Each plaque cites just one victim and is placed at their last freely chosen abode. When entire families were killed, a sort of family tree of Stolpersteiner is recreated with parents placed above their children. Most are Jews, but there are stones for Roma, deserters, Jehovah's Witnesses, homosexuals, mentally or physically disabled people, and various others deemed undesirable by Nazis. A few are dedicated to survivors who managed to escape. The memorials are discreet, yet impossible not to stumble upon, at least metaphorically. One house in Brussels has 16 in front of its threshold, Berlin alone has more than 10,000 Stolpersteiner. The Holocaust is richly remembered in cities across Europe. A giant memorial in the German capital opened in 2005 is a staple of the tourist circuit. But to honour the victims collectively is not the same as remembering each for who they were. Six million Jews is abstract. It is a number, says Mr Demnig. You cannot imagine a number... A plaque evokes a person, a story, perhaps some descendants in faraway lands. What started as a one-off project of a few dozen stones snowballed as demand for the decentralised memorial scheme kept coming. A Jewish custom beseeching the living to remember the dead helped spur requests across Germany and, from 2006, the rest of Europe. At first, the stones were laid without much in the way of permission – now local authorities are generally happy to help. Sporting a wide-brimmed fedora, a red bandana around his neck and a denim shirt, Europe's rememberer-in-chief is no establishment figure. Mr Demnig is from the 1968 generation, the first to have only heard about the war rather than lived through it. In his student days, protesters sought to understand better what the Nazis and Germany had wrought. There was something provocative in remembering, like a rebuke to those who had hoped it would all be forgotten. Kids started to ask their parents questions that few relished answering, such as, in Mr Demnig's case, how to explain the picture he had found in his family attic of his own father in uniform manning an anti-aircraft gun. These days, Mr Demnig has complemented his artistic talent with expertise in logistics and civil engineering, in the back of the Peugeot van that he drives alone across Europe for over 200 days a year are the various angle grinders, chisels and shovels needed to prise open pavements, though mostly the holes are dug in advance these days. After making the first 7,000 stones himself, Mr Demnig roped in help. 
Now a small team and non-profit foundation assist with manufacturing the Stolpelsteiner and taking appeals for new ones. Many requesters are descendants of the victims. The family's assent is always sought anyway. Sometimes the initiative comes from neighbours or students. Mr Demnig insists on laying the first stone in a new town himself, after which community groups can take over, sparing the ageing German's knees. The elegance of the Stolpelsteiner has caught the public imagination. Around 700 a month are installed these days. Their glistening patina, regularly cleaned by volunteers, is art in itself. Each plaque is handcrafted, better to contrast with the machine-like efficiency of the Nazis. But, Mr Demnig says, the process of a community looking for new ways never to forget is a form of art too. The ceremony in Brussels lasted only a few minutes. When it was over, Mr Demnig drove off. There was a stone to lay by the Belgian coast that afternoon, then another dozen in the Netherlands over the following week. After the speeches, the crowd on the Chaussée de Waterloo dispersed. The flowers from Australia were soon swept away by the rain. The stone remains. Britain The Economist, December 16th to December 22nd, 2023. In the Britain section, the Tories, a flight from reality. The housing market, grand designs. Badgett on cheer up here, it may never happen. And more. Britain The Tories A Flight from Reality How did a Rwandan gambit end up consuming the Conservative Party? The story of the modern Conservative Party can be found in Rwanda. In 2007, then in opposition under David Cameron, the party launched Project Umubano. Tory MPs and activists volunteered in impoverished Rwandan villages where they built schools, taught English or played cricket. Mr Cameron visited Kigali, embraced President Paul Kagame and talked about aid and climate change. It all showed that the Tories had been detoxified. Lord Cameron is still around as Rishi Sunak's foreign secretary. So is Mr Kagame, now in his 23rd year of repressive rule. And Rwanda transfixes the party more than ever. In 2022, the British government struck a deal to deport asylum seekers to Kigali. The failure to see a single migrant take off has become a humiliation for Mr Sunak. And the scheme now symbolises a different set of Tory values, an authoritarian approach to border control, a disdain for checks and balances, and the triumph of performativeness over pragmatism. The idea of sending asylum seekers to a faraway land has tickled the Conservative fringe for decades. Whimsy became policy under Boris Johnson, whose tenure saw an increase in migrants attempting to cross the Channel in small boats. Pretty Patel, his Home Secretary, spitballed numerous schemes to deter them, wave machines in the sea, jet ski patrols, or sending folk to British territories in the South Atlantic. She struck lucky with Mr Kagame, who in April 2022 agreed a Migration and Economic Development Partnership with the British government. People who would otherwise seek asylum in Britain would be flown to Kigali, which would process claims and settle successful applicants there. Britain would pay Rwanda handsomely, £240 million, that's $300 million, or 2.3% of Rwandan GDP, so far, plus another £50 million next year, plus expenses for every migrant sent. Mr Johnson was gung-ho about getting the deal over the line. Money, no object, according to Sir Anthony Selden, his biographer. Concerns from officials were brushed aside. Sir Matthew Rycroft, the permanent secretary at the Home Office, refused to sign it off as value for money, declaring that evidence of a deterrent effect is highly uncertain. The UN's refugee agency accused Britain of shirking its responsibilities. 
In June 2022, the first flight of asylum seekers was grounded after the European Court of Human Rights issued an emergency ruling. A cannier party might have used Mr Johnson's fall to quietly ditch the scheme. But in the Tory leadership contest that summer, endorsing the Rwanda scheme was a virility test for any contender. Thus, Mr Sunak determined not to be outflanked, promised that migrants would end up in Kigali, not King's Cross. Mr Sunak has actually made a decent go of his pledge to stop the boats. The number of illegal arrivals was 33% lower between July and September 2023 than a year earlier, due largely to a returns deal with the Albanian government. But the Rwanda gambit became the defining test of his government on November 15th, when the Supreme Court struck the scheme down. Since Rwanda's asylum system was defective, the judges found there was a real risk that people in danger would be sent on to unsafe destinations that would breach international and domestic laws. Here was another chance for Mr Sunak to back down, yet he was under internal pressure to push ahead. New data showed that net migration of all forms had hit a record of 745,000 in 2022. Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary until Mr Sunak fired her last month, and a former Project Umubanu volunteer, accused him of thwarting measures necessary to make the Rwanda deal viable. Above all, she wanted notwithstanding clauses to block off Britain's obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights, or ECHR. So, Mr Sunak sought to rescue the scheme. On December 5th, James Cleverley, his new Home Secretary, signed a treaty with Rwanda setting out how Kigali must treat the deportees. It is to be ratified in a new British law, the Safety of Rwanda Bill, which requires courts to accept that Rwanda is safe and seeks to disapply bits of human rights legislation that might prevent the scheme from going ahead. The bill cleared its first legislative hurdle on December 12th, but no one is happy. A constellation of the Conservative right wants it to go further. When Parliament reconvenes in January, they will try to wall off any remaining avenues for individuals to appeal against deportations. The One Nation group of Tory moderates, which claims to number more than 100 MPs, has said the bill is already at the limit of what is tolerable. The party is poised for weeks of haggling and division. The combination of factionalism, self-absorbed backbenchers and enormous payments to foreign governments has direct echoes of the crisis that engulfed the Tories under Theresa May during the 2016-19 fight to implement Brexit. Backbench organisers from that time are enjoying being back in the limelight. As then, careerists sense an opportunity in rallying to the right as the election approaches and power ebbs from Mr Sunak. On December 6th, Robert Jenrick, a one-time ally of the Prime Minister, known as Robert Generic for his colourless views, resigned as Immigration Minister to demand a harder line. The hope of getting flights airborne before the general election may be forlorn. The bill is likely to face heavy amendment in the House of Lords, which is increasingly concerned at the expansion of executive power. Britain is still a signatory in international law to the ECHR. An appeal to the court in Strasbourg is therefore highly likely. Withdrawal from the court's jurisdiction entirely may emerge as the Tory selectorate's new litmus test for a future leader. 71% of party members back that idea. Project Yumubano was wound up in 2017. A gala dinner was held in Kigali, attended by scores of Tory MPs and activists. Mr Kagami was the guest of honour. A message from Mrs May congratulated him on his election victory that year, in which he won 98.8% of the vote. Their nation's friendship would endure for a long time, he said. So too the strange entanglement between Rwanda and the Conservatives. Britain Government versus the Courts Expelliarmus the magical thinking behind Britain's new Rwanda bill. Magical thinking is an overused term. 
Yet it well describes the government's new Safety of Rwanda bill, which passed its first vote in Parliament on December 12th. The scheme the bill seeks to resurrect, sending asylum seekers to Rwanda, is not grounded in reality, as laws should be. It won't stop the boats. Kigali could take only a few hundred of the tens of thousands of asylum seekers who have crossed the English Channel in recent years. The scheme pretends that Rwanda's asylum system protects human rights, as Britain's does, when it does not come close. That means it is also unlawful, as the Supreme Court ruled last month. The chief risk is of refoulement, the return of asylum seekers to dangerous countries. The bill is designed to swat such objections aside. Part of it describes a treaty that James Cleverly, the Home Secretary, signed in Kigali on December 5th. It has some differences from an initial agreement made in 2022. The most substantial is Rwanda's undertaking that it will not send asylum seekers to any country other than Britain, thus surely eroding any deterrent power the scheme might have. There will be a new monitoring committee and an appeals tribunal. None of these measures resolves the concerns about Rwanda identified by the Supreme Court. In its ruling, it explained that to comply with international and domestic laws, Rwanda would need to change in time-consuming ways. No matter, for the bill's key passage reads like a line from a fairy tale, in which countries are ruled by imperious monarchs. Every decision-maker, it says, must conclusively treat the Republic of Rwanda as a safe country. What does this mean? Nothing good. The bill says decision-makers includes courts. If the bill makes it onto the statute book, the courts would be obliged to follow a law that tells it to ignore Britain's highest one. This is a remarkable thing for a bill to require, observed Parliament's Joint Committee on Human Rights. Though Britain has no written constitution, this undermines the constitutional role of the judiciary, arguably jeopardising both the separation of powers and the rule of law. The new bill still allows some asylum seekers to claim that Rwanda is not safe for them and for the British courts to consider such claims, though not because of possible refoulement. That has angered some hardline Tories. Although the bill disapplies parts of several domestic laws, like the Human Rights Act 1998, it also cannot prevent the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg from intervening. That raises the possibility that if the bill becomes law and asylum seekers are put on a plane to Kigali, the court would object, sparking a new Tory push to leave the convention it oversees. The more likely outcome is that the bill founders in the House of Lords. The Salisbury Convention holds that the Lords should not obstruct a government's manifesto commitments. But the Tory manifesto from 2019 does not mention the Rwanda scheme. It does, however, promise to continue to grant asylum and support to refugees fleeing persecution. Britain Wes Streeting Health Tourism Labour's prospective health secretary seeks inspiration abroad. Is Wes Streeting, the Shadow Health Secretary, a potential future Prime Minister? On a recent trip to Singapore, the Labour MP for Ilford North looked like one. Glad-handing dignitaries, Mr Streeting combined the politics of Sir Tony Blair, the boyish charm of Lord Cameron and the enthusiasm for a Singapore sling of Boris Johnson. He was there after receiving a Lee Kuan Yew Fellowship in honour of Singapore's founding father and a fellow Cambridge alumnus for his excellent track record and extraordinary potential. Mr Streeting is still more potential than record. He has not yet served in government. In his memoir, he lists as one of his greatest achievements a campaign in student politics to persuade a bank to extend interest-free overdrafts but he is likely to get a chance soon to show what he can do. Labour is 20 points ahead of the Conservatives in the polls. 
Barring a shock in the next general election, which is due to be held before the end of January 2025, Mr Streeting will be given the mammoth job of fixing Britain's beloved but creaking National Health Service, or NHS. Mr Streeting is at least willing to be blunt about the scale of the task ahead and about the need for change. The NHS should be a service, not a shrine, he says. During a briefing at Singapore's largest hospital, he smiles at an acronym used by its bosses, GROSS, for Get Rid of Stupid Stuff. He saw a lot of stupid stuff when he had kidney cancer in 2021 at the age of just 38. Among other things, it took him three appointments to get a follow-up scan. We've got to turn the NHS on its head and focus on prevention, early intervention, faster diagnosis and faster access to treatment, says Mr Streeting. That's better for patients and also better value for taxpayers. Less clear is whether he can actually shake things up. His call to move more care out of NHS hospitals has been repeated by predecessors from both political parties for decades. His mantra about streamlining the NHS's bureaucracy could have been lifted straight from Sir Tony's New Britain, My Vision of a Young Country, a book Mr Streeting was ridiculed for reading at school. Like the former Labour leader, Mr Streeting's focus is on reform, not upheaval. But unlike Sir Tony, he does not have lots of money to spend. Singapore offered Mr Streeting food for thought as well as accolades. Among rich countries, it has perhaps done the most to tackle the tricky mix of more chronic disease, an ageing population and a shortage of healthcare workers. In 1961, Singaporeans could expect their lives to be five years shorter than those of Britain's. Now they live two years longer. Life expectancy is 83, compared with 81 in Britain. Some 6.5 million people, more than Singapore's entire population, are currently waiting for at least one NHS treatment in England. Yet the lessons of a small city-state are also not that easy to replicate in Britain. The Singaporean government can easily build apartment blocks to care for the elderly because it owns all the land. A more authoritarian state is able to incentivise workers to stay healthy with sticks as well as slick technology. Ironically, it is Britain that has provided some of the blueprint for the city-state's healthcare system. Mr Streeting is impressed by Singapore's polyclinics, which offer a range of primary care appointments and procedures. But most Singaporeans still use British-style general practitioners, a group Mr Streeting likes to criticise. Singaporean clinicians stress the importance of CT and MRI scanners, machines that Britain helped pioneer, but which it now has too few of. Even initiatives that seem decidedly Singaporean, such as apps nudging people to walk more and eat healthily, have a British influence. Singapore's inspiration for behavioural science came from the UK, but we make bugger all use of it, Mr Streeting notes. Mr Streeting is no stranger to beating the odds. Behind the veneer of Cambridge lies a tough upbringing in East London council houses. His family history is colourful. Not many MPs can say that their grandmother gave birth to their mother handcuffed and under prison guard. His grandfather held up shops with a shotgun in a rubber mask he nicknamed Claude, Mr Streeting's chances of ever leading his party may be hampered by his gender. Labour has never had a female leader, which makes many of its members uncomfortable. But if he were to succeed in putting the NHS right, he would have realised his potential, and then some. Britain The Housing Market Grand Designs Politicians want more houses, but the industry does not want to add supply. Britain's politicians are finally beginning to compete to put up more houses. Sir Keir Starmer, Labour's leader, promises to oversee the building of 1.5 million homes over five years, if it wins the next election. 
The Tories have consistently fallen short of the target of 300,000 new homes per year. But last month, Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, announced reforms to the planning system and additional subsidies for affordable homes. That followed a relaxation in environmental rules which had crimped some projects. The need for more houses is real. Sadly, for Britons struggling to buy a house, policymakers are not the only people who matter. The folk who will have to meet these goals, the developers, are planning to cut back, not expand. The timeliest official data, covering only England, reported completions falling by 3% in the year to June. In a trading update in October, Barrett Developments, Britain's largest house builder, said that it expected to finish between 13,250 and 14,250 homes in 2024, a fall of around 20% on its expectations for 2023. The Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, or RICS, a trade body, reckons that building activity is the weakest it has been since the start of the pandemic. Housing supply is likely to fall at least for the next year, according to Simon Rubinson, RICS chief economist. Two years of rising interest rates have been tough for the housing market. The average rate on a new two-year fixed mortgage, the benchmark product, has risen from 1.57% in December 2021 to 5.28% in November 2023. Housing market activity has declined sharply, with the monthly volume of transactions down by 21% over the year to October. The Office for National Statistics says house prices fell by 0.1% in the 12 months to September, the first annual fall since 2012. Builders are reluctant to increase supply into a weak market. The talk now is of carefully managing building activity. Building rates, says one boss, have long been depressed by supply-side issues around the planning system and in recent years by rising prices for materials and a shortage of skilled labour. But now the problem is on the demand side. People just can't afford the mortgages. Rather than dropping headline prices, developers offer what they euphemistically term incentives for buyers. It is more common for free carpets and kitchen appliances to be bundled in with new builds. Some developers have even offered to pay £1,000, that's $1,260 per month, for the first 12 or 18 months of new buyers' mortgages, or to hand buyers cash to increase their deposit. Although few analysts foresee a crash, most expect the market to remain tepid until interest rates fall appreciably. With the Bank of England signalling that rates will not be cut much for at least a year, that may be some time away. The Office for Budget Responsibility, a fiscal watchdog, expects house prices to fall by 7.6% from a peak in the final quarter of 2022 to a trough in the final quarter of 2024. As a result, private sector home building is likely to remain weak for the coming 18 to 24 months. If Labour is serious about building 1.5 million homes, in other words, it may have to step up government-supported social housing, though that would be hard to square with the party's current fiscal rules. The politicians certainly cannot assume that developers will be there, diggers at the ready, to build. We need to see a more stable and robust market before we accept Accelerate again, says one insider. Britain. Transport. Pedicabonomics. London's riotous pedicabs are about to be regulated. Step out of the Lyceum Theatre after seeing The Lion King on a Friday night and the noise is cacophonous. Some 30 pedicabs, many fur-lined and dotted with bright lights, lie in wait. Drivers woo theatre-goers by blaring out music, schmaltzy Christmas songs, trancy electropop and bangra. Long popular in South Asia, cycle rickshaws arrived in London only in 1998. In peak season, as many as 900 pedicabs now ferry tourists and clubbers around the West End and other night spots. Nobody is sure of the exact number because they are unregulated. Outside London, pedicabs are treated like taxis and are scarce. 
But in the capital, the three-wheelers benefit from a bizarre loophole in the Metropolitan Public Carriage Act, a law passed in 1869 to regulate horse-drawn carriages. Loose drafting allows pedicab operators to slip through its provisions. As long as drivers negotiate a separate fare with each rider, they escape regulation. The first pedicabs in London were merely a fun way for tourists to get around. They did not cost much more than a ride in a taxi. These days they are bigger and swisher and pricier. Shadahan Khan, who takes your correspondent for a spin, charges £5, that's $6 a minute, plus a service fee. Most customers want a round trip, he says. It is less about getting from A to B than the experience. His cab is adorned with neon lights and plush seats. The sound system is open to requests. In parts of Soho, the pavements and streets now resemble a rickshaw edition of Pimp My Ride, a TV show about souped-up cars. Most pedicabs are not owned by their drivers. A standard electric-powered version costs some £5,000, a pimped-out one more. Instead, drivers rent them for about £200 a week. The competition means lots of waiting around for fares. A typical shift might involve as few as six rides between late afternoon and the early hours, but the pay is good. Able to charge whatever they can get away with, drivers may make up to £1,300 a week after rental costs. They are quick to spot niches. Some cater to wealthy tourists from the Middle East. Cabs are emblazoned with pictures of Arab leaders and play traditional music. Others to drunk Britons, Union Jacks and Oasis. Lack of regulation has caused problems. The gullible and the plastered alike can be whacked by unscrupulous drivers. Residents complain about the noise. Safety is another concern. Some pedicabs have great sound systems but no lights or brakes, says Andrzej Wazinski of MaxPro, a manufacturer. Which is why this riotous free market experiment is coming to an end. Legislation expected in the new year will fix fares and impose noise restrictions. Drivers will have to pass safety checks and prove they have the right to work. Other cities struggling with pedicabs like Barcelona and Amsterdam may take note. The aim is to regulate, not eradicate, says Nikki Aiken, MP for Westminster, who backs the change. The streets of Soho may become a bit less raucous as a result. Britain British cooking First, take one live goose. Cookery books tell you a little bit about food and a lot about society and life itself. Countryman's Cooking was published in Britain in 1965. It has many strengths. If you wish to know how to brain a goose, it is peerless. In brief, bludgeon it briskly. If you want to find out how to behead a pheasant or disembowel a rabbit, it is invaluable. If, however, you wish to encase these animals in a pie, it is less helpful. For its author, W. M. W. Fowler, a former bomber pilot, has this to say on pastry recipes. I cannot help you. In fact, Fowler did have a suggested method for pastry making. Take one telephone, he advised. Ring one nice female neighbour with it, liberally baste her with drink, a couple of stiff gins, add seasoning, a liberal sprinkling of blandishments and flattery, and watch your timings. Don't kiss her till she has carried out her duties. Soon enough, you would have an excellent dish. Cookery books are odd things. Reviewers might lavish their attention on literary novels, but some of the real potboilers of the publishing industry are those with recipes. Joe Wicks, a strapping fitness guru come chef, has sold 3.7 million books in Britain since his first book came out in 2015. In that same period, William Shakespeare has sold only 2.2 million, George Orwell 1.8 million, and Charles Dickens a mere 1.4 million. 
Britons may buy cookery books, especially as presents, during December, but they often don't use them. It is said that if someone cooks a single recipe from an entire book, then that is considered a success. To many, the puzzle is less that such books sell well, more that they sell at all, especially in an age of free online recipes. I wonder why people buy cookery books, says Claudia Roden, an Egyptian-born British cookery writer. For a long time, people didn't. The genre arose relatively recently. For centuries, those who could cook couldn't write, and those who could write couldn't cook. Many early recipes appeared in Books of Secrets, odd compilations that blended one part cookery with two parts pure sorcery. One 16th century volume advised its readers on everything from how to conserve quinces, add sugar, to how to comfort the heart and take away melancholy, yet more sugar. It also has a less appetising entry on recognising all the vrines that betoken death. If your urine is red, black, green or blue, be worried, and perhaps don't do any cooking. Recipe books really took off with the rise of the middle classes. As a result, they are infused with the flavour of social anxiety. Chapters from a book published in 1922 advise inexperienced hostesses how to correctly prepare a little supper after the play, luncheon for a motor excursion in winter, and a shooting party luncheon. It also offered a brusquely titled chapter called For the Too Fat. If such books were aimed mainly at people on the way up, they also catered for those on the way down. One book published in 1938 advised those who once had cooks but now lived in straitened circumstances, perhaps even in a bed-sitting room, on how long to hang a partridge before roasting it, five to eight days. Where you should hang a partridge for a week in a bed-sit, it did not say. Cookbooks shine a light on societies well beyond Britain. In 2017, Al-Qaeda, a terrorist group, started to produce a magazine called Your Home that was aimed at the good jihadi wife. It offered problem pages, tips on washing up, and, of course, recipes. The recipe for jihadi mashed potatoes explained to its eager readers that for a truly successful mash, you should boil the potatoes first – and only then mash them. You suspect, says Dr Elizabeth Kendall, an Arabist and mistress of Girton College, Cambridge, that it was written by guys. Ostensibly, recipe books are about food. In truth, says B. Wilson, author of The Secret of Cooking, they are about everything else too. Cookery books are as evocative as any spell, able to conjure up worlds with a handful of words. Open Something by Yotam Otolenghi, a chef and restaurateur, and run your eye down its list of esoteric ingredients with their pomegranate molasses and za'atar and rose harissa. You're instantly transported to the Middle East, or at least to somewhere smug in North London. In Culinary Jottings for Madras, a treatise for Anglo-Indian exiles, published in 1878, Readers find themselves at the elbow of an English housewife as she learns how to make Victoria pudding in southern India at the height of the Raj. It turns out to be easy enough. Hand the recipe to your butler, who can hand it to your cook. For all that recipes pretend to be instruction, they are often epitaphs for dying worlds. According to Dr Kendall, the jihadi recipes were produced when the beginnings of the Me Too movement meant that jihadis were worried women might start to get ideas. Countrymen's cooking may have opened with the line, this book is written for men, but it came out just as Britain was becoming less willing to cater to them. Ms Roden began her first book on the cuisine of Egyptian Jews when they left Egypt after the Six-Day War in 1967. Cookery was the only thing we could take along with us, our memories and our food. Our lives are full of death and grief and unexpected things, says Ms Wilson. Recipes give people order, joy, and if we do them right, a happy ending. Yes, there are regrets and pains and exile, 
and there is the ever-present risk of vrine that turns unexpectedly blue. But there is rosemary to be chopped too, and potatoes to peel, and roast chickens to be taken from the oven. So take one helping of sorrows and a soupçon of social anxiety. Add a powerful desire for comfort and begin. Britain Budget Cheer up, Keir. It may never happen. Labour is too pessimistic about the backdrop it is set to inherit. Usually politicians try to offer optimism. Sir Keir Starmer's Labour Party specialises in despair. This is worse than the 1970s, said Sir Keir in one speech. We are in a hole. Every Labour figure emits the same dirge about Britain's high debt, low growth and exhausted public services. Even moments of hope are tempered with warnings of misery. In a rare bout of cheer, Sir Keir promised a realistic hope, a frank hope, a hope that levels with you about the hard road ahead. Hooray! If Labour wins the next election, as is highly likely, the consensus is that it would inherit a total mess – in 1997, New Labour were handed a booming economy and low debt. In 2010, the Conservatives took over thriving public services. In 2024, Labour will receive neither. But the party harbours a dirty secret. Some problems will fix themselves, some things are better than they look, and a few conundrums can be solved with only a little effort. Pessimism is judicious. Sir Keir would enter office with the lowest expectations of any Prime Minister since the 1970s. The good thing about low expectations, they are easily met. Sir Keir has promised to boost economic growth, for instance, which is forecast to crawl along at 0.6% this year and 0.7% next year. But the Office for Budget Responsibility, a fiscal watchdog, is already predicting growth of almost 2% by 2028 through no effort of Labour's own. Labour will undoubtedly claim credit. In truth, growth can hardly get worse. Labour engages in pantomime booing of Conservative tax increases. In fact, the Tories have done Labour a favour by pushing through the steepest tax rises in the best part of a century. That means the public finances are now highly geared. A small jump in growth can lead to a big jump in tax revenues. The Conservatives took the political pain. Labour can spend the proceeds. A steep rise in interest rates, which started last year, has hurt both public and private finances. Rising debt costs blew a hole in the Treasury's accounts – Britain now spends about £83 billion, that's $104 billion, 3.6% of GDP, a year on interest. Each quarter, hundreds of thousands of voters move from a cheap mortgage to an expensive one. But inflation is falling steeply. The markets expect a slew of rate cuts in 2025, just in time to benefit a newish government. Public and private finances will then improve, and quickly. In the course of the next Parliament, mortgage renewal will flip from being a moment of despair to one of relief. Seemingly bold political promises by Labour are easily met. Sir Keir says that his party will whittle down National Health Service, or NHS, waiting lists, for instance. But these are due to peak next summer anyway the queue is likely to shorten from the end of 2024, regardless of who lives in Downing Street. Reforming Britain's NHS is the more Augean task. After a bout of restrained spending from 2010, the service has been doused in cash in recent years, yet barely treats more patients. Extra money always takes time to have an effect. A lag occurred in the 2000s, Greater funding initially failed to improve productivity, but it did so eventually. Perhaps the NHS really is irredeemable. It is more likely that the fading effects of the pandemic, decent funding and improvements to management will make a difference. If so, the effects will show up slap bang in the middle of a Labour term. Other political problems will melt like snow in spring. 
Sakir talks tough on net migration, which hit an all-time high of 745,000 in 2022. Labour's pledges to cut this number will happen anyway. One-off influxes such as arrivals from Ukraine will end. The backlog of moves delayed by lockdowns when people could not travel will clear. Labour's promise to return net migration to its recent and still historically high norms is not much of a challenge, yet it will still be seen as an achievement. When it comes to the EU too, things are set to stop getting worse without Labour needing to do much. The pain of Brexit was front-loaded, argues John Springford, from the Centre for European Reform, a think tank. Exporters have already adjusted to the new relationship. It is politically easy for Secure to forge closer ties with Brussels. Since eight in ten Labour voters said they would rejoin the EU, a tighter and more prosperous relationship with the EU is perfectly viable. Stability in government will bring its own rewards. Britain has been politically chaotic for the best part of a decade. The Conservatives have swung from a vision of a small state government sat snugly inside the EU to a free-spending one far outside it. In the process, it went through five prime ministers with often radically different agendas in seven years. Labour would take power with a vague, uninspiring plan to improve Britain's public services without spending money and a pledge to generate growth through modest reforms. But pulling in one direction for five years would still do Britain a lot of good. Call it the being normal dividend. Some pessimism is justified. Unrealistic spending plans by the Conservatives, subsequently adopted by Labour, will not be adhered to. Tax rises will, almost inevitably, have to plug the gap. Things can always go wrong. Inflation may flare up again, meaning interest rates stay higher for longer. The NHS may indeed prove unreformable. Bored labour backbenchers will make trouble eventually. Assuming that things will inevitably improve is naive. Yet so is assuming that things must remain terrible. Given the choice, the Labour leadership would grab the benign backdrop Sir Tony Blair enjoyed in his early years in office. But a golden inheritance brings high expectations. During the 2005 general election campaign, Sir Tony was harangued by voters complaining that GPs were too quick to see patients. A rotten inheritance, in contrast, means any improvement will do. Sakir is set to take office at the bottom of a trough. Luckily for Labour, when you have hit the bottom, the only way is up. International The Economist, December 16th to December 22nd, 2023. In the international section, COP28 concludes. The long goodbye... International COP28 concludes The long goodbye Climate talks at last lead to a global deal on cutting fossil fuel use. Most evenings at COP28, the latest instalment of the annual United Nations Climate Conference, delegates were treated to a dazzling light show. It transformed the central dome of the venue, Expo City in Dubai, into a teeming coral reef. Priority was given to prettiness over precision. Turtles swam cosily with similar-sized humpback whales. A change in soundtrack saw them suddenly turned into dancing blood-red squid. In the end, the conference delivered the same combination of deliberate choreography and otherworldly fantasy. For the first time in more than three decades of international climate diplomacy, all parties explicitly agreed to move away from using fossil fuels in energy systems. These systems generate vast wealth, but also the bulk of the world's emissions. On December 13th, the meeting's president, Sultan Al-Jaber, chief executive of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, announced that the agreement would be passed without objections. The plenary rose in applause. 
Outside, the desert sun beat down on a planet that is already around 1.2 degrees centigrade warmer than in pre-industrial times. The world's largest gas-fired power plant, just a stone's throw away, ran on regardless. Nevertheless, it was a rare success for multilateralism, given the 198 delegations involved. The conference took place against the backdrop of wars in Ukraine and the Gaza Strip, both of which have worsened divisions between the rich and poor worlds. An agreement before the summit between America and China laid the groundwork for its success. The pair promised to triple the deployment of renewable energy by 2030, a declaration originally made by the G20, which ultimately inspired a clause in COP28's final agreement. Similarly, a cross-cutting coalition of countries from the EU, Latin America and the Alliance of Small Island States, AOSIS, repeatedly pushed for more progress on reducing fossil fuel use. The final text is a product of bitter compromises between the desire to limit the planet's warming and the economic interests aligned with fossil fuels. It calls on parties to transition away from fossil fuels in energy systems and to accelerate action in this critical decade so as to achieve net zero by 2050. Although many of the deal's provisions leave much room for interpretation, the agreement forged in Dubai could serve to indicate the direction of travel. But like all UN climate deals, there is no enforcement mechanism within the latest one. Government actions alone will give it teeth. COP28 marked a critical moment in the UN climate calendar. The Paris Agreement, signed in 2015, decreed that this year's meeting would be the first global stocktake, an inventory of progress on cutting emissions thus far and feedback on how efforts could improve. The verdict that countries remain well off track was not a surprise. The text states that greenhouse gas emissions need to be cut by 43% by 2030 and 60% by 2035, relative to 2019 levels, if limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade by the end of the century is to be considered plausible. It noted with alarm that even if every aspect of countries' current plans were met, emissions reductions in 2030 looked closer to a dismal 5%, putting the world on track for a rise of 2.1% centigrade to 2.8% centigrade, even in the best-case scenario. More urgent reduction is possible. The cuts of 7% year-on-year needed to hit the target are not. The exact implications of the deal will be fiercely contested. Language calling for a phase-out or phase-down of fossil fuels was removed. It was a red line for some oil producers. Petro states fret over what climate action could mean for their vast reserves. On the other side, a major objection from AOSIS was the text's litany of loopholes. These included its focus on energy systems, which excludes fossil fuels used in other sectors, such as the production of plastics or in fertilisers for agriculture. Another concerned abatement technologies, such as the Carbon Capture and Storage Systems, CCS, meant to divert the carbon dioxide produced by power plants rather than see it emitted into the atmosphere. Many observers fear CCS will be used by fossil fuel producers in lieu of shifting away from coal and oil. Vague references to the acceptability of undefined transitional fuels, presumably natural gas, drew criticism too. Other complaints focused on the weakness of the language used as countries were called on to act and on the various conditions that could allow some to delay peaking their carbon emissions. Special terms may be necessary for many poor countries but can offer others excuses to delay action. And noting that countries must behave in line with science will probably not be enough to keep governments on track. That a climate deal is tackling fossil fuels directly is mostly the result of changes to their perceived importance in America and China. That is partly a reflection of facts on the ground. America's domestic consumption of oil and natural gas is forecast shortly to either fall or plateau by the Energy Information Administration, its own official forecaster.
That will, however, free up more for America to export as the world's biggest oil producer. Meanwhile, record sales of solar panels and electric vehicles offer the possibility of prosperity without pollution. China is also changing its approach. Some analysts think emissions in the country have already peaked as expanding renewable and nuclear capacity meets increases in demand. Transport is being electrified too, but it is difficult to decipher the trends precisely. The country is also building more coal plants in pursuit of energy security. This is not the same China as it was a decade ago, says Li Shuo of the Asia Society Policy Institute, which analyzes such matters. Yet the Dubai deal also shows that the world still has not figured out how to tackle the many problems that climate change poses simultaneously. The major achievement of COP27, held in Sharm el Sheikh in 2022, was an agreement that the rich countries most responsible for rising temperatures should pay poor ones for some of the loss and damage they suffer. The price of that advance was meagre action on fossil fuels. The same trade-off played out again in 2023, but in reverse. Better language on fossil fuels, little real progress on the needs of the poorest. The formal establishment of the Loss and Damage Fund, agreed to the year before, on COP28's first day, was much celebrated. The glitz faded when it emerged that much of the $700 million put in it was already promised to other projects. Diplomats will struggle to duck such arguments next year when the conference travels to Baku in Azerbaijan. Between 2020 and 2025, rich countries promised to deliver $100 billion a year to poor countries in climate finance. A follow-on deal will need to be agreed upon as related discussions in Dubai mostly focused on procedure, not substance. Some progress was made outside the UN negotiating rooms. Mr Al-Jaber boasted that $83 billion in climate finance had been offered up during the conference, including $30 billion for a new private investment fund from the United Arab Emirates. Development banks, such as the World Bank, announced an increase in funding and new clauses in debt contracts that would allow countries to defer payment after natural disasters. Other challenges loom. The world may soon have to contend with an America that is not willing to negotiate with either China or the UN on climate change. President Donald Trump withdrew from the Paris Climate Agreement as soon as he was able in 2020, arguing that climate change was a Chinese invention to hamper American competitiveness. Mr Trump is currently the front-runner for the Republican nomination for president. A victory for him at the polls in November could lead to another four years of slow climate diplomacy. For all the concerns and complaints, most delegates appear to leave the Jamboree in Dubai with a sense of achievement. Many smiled and stopped to snap photographs. Mr Al-Jaber declared the agreement historic. Others proclaimed it as the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel era. Both might prove to be true. Neither is in any way guaranteed. For all they are resisted by oil producers, the UN climate treaties are normally toothless and always imperfect. This one is no exception, with every stride made the result of giving up some ground elsewhere. It must be seen as an aid for convincing governments and businesses that oil, gas and coal are no longer the solid investments they once were and that they would be better directing their money towards cleaner sources of energy. Otherwise, it will be a little more than a pleasing display of light. Business The Economist, December 16th to December 22nd, 2023. In the business section, advertising. Welcome to the ad-free internet. German business, season's grumblings. Bartleby on the art of delegation and more. Business. 
Advertising. Welcome to the ad-free internet. As the rich pay to banish commercials, advertisers hunt for their attention elsewhere. For a preview of what lies wrapped beneath the Christmas tree, log in to Facebook. The social network tracks its users' behaviour so intimately that it is able to personalise adverts with a precision that sometimes verges on mind reading. Its ad-stuffed newsfeed at this time of year embodies the internet's great trade-off. Consumers enjoy free services, but must submit to bombardment with commercials from companies that know who has been naughty or nice. Yet increasingly, those consumers with deep enough pockets are getting the chance to escape the online ad men. Last month, Facebook's owner Meta began offering customers in Europe. Ad-free subscriptions to Facebook and its sister network Instagram for nine euros ninety-nine. That's ten dollars eighty-five a month. In October, X, formerly Twitter, launched an ad-free option. In the same month, TikTok, a fast-growing Chinese-owned video app, announced that it was testing an ad-free subscription. The following month, Snapchat, another social media rival, said it was doing the same. Social networks are not the only medium allowing the group that advertisers most covet, the better off with money to splurge, to wriggle beyond their reach. From video and audio to news and gaming, a combination of regulation and technological change is encouraging media companies to offer alternatives. We are in a world where it will be increasingly possible to avoid ads. Says Brian Weiser of Madison and Wall, an advertising consultancy, as the rich opt out of commercials on some platforms, advertisers are therefore looking for new places to catch them. Grabbing the attention of the well-heeled via old media has been getting harder for some time, as the internet has eroded the value of their ads. Newspapers and magazines have made a decade-long pivot. To other sources of revenue, whereas in 2014 only five percent of adults in rich countries paid for a subscription to an online news site, this year 13 percent did, according to Oxford University's Reuters Institute. During the same period, ad-supported radio has been giving way to streamed music and podcasts on platforms like Spotify. Forty percent of whose five hundred and seventy-five million users cough up ten dollars ninety-nine a month to listen ad-free. TV, on which adverts are worth one hundred and sixty billion dollars a year, is well into its own digital transition. Last year, streaming overtook cable and broadcast networks to become the most watched television in America. According to Nielsen, a firm which tracks viewership, whereas linear TV is stuffed with ads, three quarters of American streaming customers pay to skip ads, estimates Antenna, another data firm. Streamers such as Netflix and Disney Plus have launched ad-supported tiers in the past year or so. Amazon's Prime Video will follow suit shortly. But they show only about four minutes of commercials per hour, compared with more like fifteen on American broadcast TV. As viewers drift to streaming, television's ad inventory in America will decrease by a quarter in the next four years, estimates Mr. Weiser. Social media seemed like a safer space for advertisers. For years, Facebook promised that it was free and always will be. Two things have changed that. One is regulation. Meta's ad-free plan in Europe follows a series of court rulings establishing that, under regional data protection rules, tech firms must get users' consent before showing them personalized ads. Rather than making its ads less effective, Meta is offering the alternative of no ads for a price. Privacy campaigners say that this price is so high as to be prohibitive. Expect more legal battles in the new year. Meta will not launch the plan elsewhere unless it has to. We will always advocate for an internet funded by ads, it said on December fourth. 
but other countries may get ideas. Britain and India are already sharpening their digital privacy laws. Tech firms are also watching Brazil, Indonesia and Australia, where Snapchat is testing its ad-free option. The other change comes from the tech platforms. Since 2021, Apple has let customers opt out of being tracked by apps, crippling the ability to personalise ads and triggering a rush to alternative methods of monetization. Snapchat launched a $3.99 per month subscription last year, offering extra features. This September, it had 5 million subscribers. Mobile games, which often rely on ads, have moved towards alternatives such as in-app purchases and subscriptions, says Tianyi Gu of Newzu, a firm of analysts. Apple and Netflix are among those to have launched game subscriptions with no ads. The existence of advert-free options does not guarantee take-up. Few Europeans will pay for Facebook or Instagram, believes Eric Seufert, author of the Mobile Dev Memo newsletter. Meta will use the low adoption rate to champion the ad-supported business model as a consumer preference, he predicts. However, as Meta's networks deal increasingly in video, switching off their ads may become more tempting for users. YouTube Premium, which charges $13.99 a month to go ad-free, had 80 million paying subscribers last year, the latest figure available, behind only Netflix, Disney Plus and Amazon Prime, among Western platforms. Children, in particular, are increasingly off-limits to ads by default. Snapchat said in August that most of its ad targeting tools would no longer be available to use on under-18s in the EU and Britain to comply with new privacy rules. Meta has made Facebook and Instagram entirely ad-free for European youngsters while it works out its legal position. Whoever pays to opt out of ads tends, for now, to be wealthier than those who sit through them. Among those paying for news online, 8 out of 10 are from medium or high-income households, according to the Reuters Institute. As well as having more money, the wealthy tend to be more privacy-conscious. The richest users are likeliest to decline to be tracked on their iPhones, says Mr Seufert. Still, early indications are that in television at least, the difference may not be big. In America, the highest-earning households make up 9% of ad-supported subscribers and 11% of ad-free ones, finds Antenna. Mr. Weiser suggests that as consumers are squeezed and spend less on nights out, they may in fact be more inclined to pay for ad-free TV. Either way, ad men are confident that they have alternative paths to reach valuable consumers. Worldwide ad spending, excluding American political spots, will reach $889 billion in 2023 and grow by 5-6% to 6 annually for the next five years, led by digital adverts, forecasts Group M, which places ads on behalf of brands. The number of ads seen on television may fall, but streamers' ability to target the commercials will make them much more effective than conventional TV spots, argues Mark Reed, head of WPP, the world's largest ad company, and Group M's parent company. Streamers' shorter ad breaks will be better at holding viewers' attention. Our clients understand that a two- to three-minute ad load is more valuable than a nine-minute ad load, says Mr Reed. In addition, streamers are eating into the time spent watching ad-free public service broadcasters, such as Britain's BBC. Advertisers can also fall back on platforms from which the rich have no escape. Spending on out-of-home media, billboards and the like, has grown by 7% this year, and is now above its pre-pandemic level, according to Magna, a research arm of Interpublic, another big ad agency. 
sponsorship of sports events and the like, remains immune to digital disruption, and other kinds of corporate persuasion, such as public relations, may benefit as it gets harder to reach people via old-school ads, says Mr. Wieser. Perhaps the biggest new advertising opportunity is in areas that never previously showed ads at all. Amazon's ruse of selling ads alongside search results on its retail site, something it began doing little more than a decade ago, will earn around $45 billion this year, more than the entire global newspaper industry did from ads. Last year, Uber started selling ads in its ride-hailing and delivery apps, personalizing them using its own data on customers, something Apple's anti-tracking changes do not affect. It expects to make $1 billion next year from this new sideline. Marriott Hotels launched an ad network last year to send targeted messages to guests on their in-room TVs. United Airlines is said to be planning to show personalized ads to passengers during their in-flight entertainment. Group M predicts that this kind of retail media will be worth more than TV advertising by 2028. Even on social networks, there will be ways for brands to reach people who pay to go ad-free. Advertisers increasingly rope in charismatic influencers who promote products to users who follow them and share their content by choice. WPP recently took a group of them to Lapland to visit Santa's home as part of a promotion for Coca-Cola. Users who pay to block ads in some areas are still likely to find them popping up in new ones. Business Big Tech Unappy Returns What Google's Antitrust Defeat means for the app economy. It took less than four hours for nine jurors to reach a verdict. On December 11th, in a San Francisco courthouse, they unanimously agreed that Google's App Store was a monopoly and that the company had engaged in anti-competitive behaviour. The decision strikes a blow against the search giant, which is concurrently embroiled in other legal battles. It may also redefine the App Store economy. Most smartphones run on one of two operating systems. Apple's iOS is a walled garden with just one App Store, its own. Other device makers tend to use Google's Android, which on paper lets in App Stores other than the Google Play Store. The case was about whether it does in practice. In 2020, Epic Games, a game studio, urged players to use its payments system to make purchases in Fortnite, its blockbuster shoot 'em up The idea was to bypass the 30% cut taken by Apple and Google on most in-app purchases in their app stores. Fortnite was briefly banned from both. Epic sued. Its lawyers argued Google was stifling competition by striking deals with, among others, smartphone makers such as Samsung and LG to give the Play Store prime placement on their devices in exchange for a cut of revenues. The jurors did not buy Google's defence that it competes fiercely with Apple as well as other app stores on Android devices. So far, so straightforward. What makes the situation strange is that the verdict is at odds with the one in Epic's near-identical case against Apple. That concluded in 2021, with Apple winning on 9 out of 10 counts, on the 10th related to the use of alternative billing systems. It lost. One reason for the difference may be that Google's fate was decided by a jury, not a judge. Public opinion is sceptical of big tech, which two-thirds of Americans regard as having too much power. Jurors may also struggle to grasp the nuances of antitrust laws. Another explanation is, ironically, that Google has tried to make its mobile software too open. Anyone can use Android's open-source code free of charge to create their own OS. By contrast, Apple's customers and developers know that it controls all aspects of the iPhone. 
Being locked in Apple's walled garden may be more palatable if consumers know what they are getting into. Less so if limits are imposed by the maker of just the operating system, which it claims is open. The verdict may influence two other lawsuits against Google by America's Department of Justice. The first went to court in September. It focuses on Google's deals to ensure it is the default search engine on various devices, including Apple's and web browsers. Such arrangements cost it $26 billion in 2021. The second is likely to begin next summer and looks at Google's advertising business. The judge in the Epic case will decide on a remedy early next year. One possibility is for app developers to be freed from Google's billing system. Last year, South Korea forced Apple and Google to enable alternative payments. The EU's new digital law has similar provisions. This may be making the App Store economy more competitive, especially for games. Microsoft, which has just concluded its $69 billion acquisition of Activision Blizzard, a big game developer, is planning its own app store for games. Epic already has one for PCs. Riot Games' arrival may launch its own. The tech giants do not like this one bit. According to Sensor Tower, a research firm, people around the world will spend about $160 billion on apps this year. Google's and Apple's commissions account for perhaps 5% of each firm's overall revenue. Operating margins for both app stores are thought to be over 70%, according to testimony in the two court cases. Google argued in court that this figure does not account for some App Store costs, such as research and development. That is much higher than the overall margins of 26% for Google and 30% for Apple last year. Google is already seeing its Play Store revenues dip, reckons Sensor Tower. So neither firm will give up without a fight. Google is challenging the juror's decision at an appeals court where a panel of judges will hear the case. Apple is appealing against the payments ruling in its Epic case. Both are finding ways around rules like those in South Korea where they let in alternative billing methods and promptly slapped a commission of up to 26% on any sum paid using them. Business. German Business Seasons Grumblings Deutschland AG is fed up with a government in disarray. Many German bosses wanted just one thing for Christmas, for Derbyshire. The country's business circles have talked about little else than these formal funding notices since November 15th. On that day, the Federal Constitutional Court declared that the government's plan to repurpose 60 billion euros, that's $66 billion, in emergency COVID-19 credit lines towards infrastructure and the energy transition was unconstitutional. This blew a hole in the coalition government's spending plans. It also raised concerns among those companies which depend on public support for their investments. Though not that numerous, they are central to the government's economic vision. And that vision in turn matters to German enterprise as a whole. In early December, Northolt, an innovative Swedish battery maker, received a Föderbescheid for a €564 million Euro subsidy to construct a €4.5 billion Euro factory in the northern German state of Schleswig-Holstein. Other companies, including those behind 11 of Germany's 27 important projects of common European interest that have yet to receive a formal funding offer, anxiously awaited their economic sweetness. What they got instead was a bitter dose of austerity. We have got to get by with significantly less money, said Olaf Scholz, the Social Democrat Chancellor, on December 13th. After tense discussions with his Green and Free Democrat partners, Mr Schultz unveiled €29 billion Euros in savings, including €12 billion Euros less for an off-budget climate and transition fund. 
Details have yet to be hammered out, but some of this will come from an early end to subsidies for electric vehicles and solar power, a higher than expected rise in the carbon tax, and a new fee on companies that use plastics. Not another for Derbyshire in sight. Mr. Schultz's belt tightening is fueling doubts about the federal and state government's other promises. Bosses are lobbying like crazy at the economy ministry, while the finance ministry is trying its best to block new spending promises, says Christoph Bertram of FGS, a consultancy. A 10 billion euro subsidy for Intel, an American chip maker, to erect a 30 billion euro semiconductor factory, which would be post-war Germany's largest single foreign investment, seems to be in doubt. So is 5 billion euros for a chip plant in Dresden to be built by TSMC, a Taiwanese manufacturer. These handouts are a costly and possibly futile attempt to compete in the global chip subsidy race. Still, scrapping them now would send a catastrophic signal about the government's trustworthiness, warns Marcel Fratscher, head of the German Institute for Economic Research, a think tank. The budget shambles adds to a litany of German business angst on top of shrinking GDP, high energy prices, a shortage of skilled workers, persistently cumbersome red tape and the rise of the populist far right. Small wonder bosses are becoming ever more deeply disillusioned with Mr. Schultz and his coalition partners. Almost 83% say that the government is not doing a good job, according to a survey in early December by a business publication. 75% would like Germany to hold new elections in 2024. An index of the business climate by the IFO, Institute, a think tank, which exceeded its pre-pandemic level for much of 2021, is once again well below it. The glum sentiment is affecting investment decisions. Capital spending by companies fell in the third quarter, year on year, having barely grown in the few previous ones. Businesses have significantly reduced their investment plans, according to a new survey of 5,000 businesses by the IFO Institute. According to the latest quarterly poll of the Mittelstand, only 24% of Germany's admired family-owned pocket multinationals are planning to invest in expansion, the lowest share since the survey began in 2010. Fully 42% said they would not invest in Germany any more. All this reflects worries about high interest rates, weak demand and general uncertainty over economic policy, explains Laura Zagis of IFO. It may also paint a flattering picture since the survey was conducted before the budget fiasco. Although most economists predict a mild recovery for the German economy next year, Sebastian Dulin of the IMK Research Institute expects the recession to persist into 2024 because of the spending cuts following the Constitutional Court's verdict. Mr. Dulin thinks that it is economically absurd to stick to strict spending limits, as Mr. Schultz is intending to do next year, at a time when the country is facing an energy crisis, giving shelter to more than one million refugees from war-torn Ukraine and suffering from economic weakness. Siegfried Rusverm, head of the BDI, Germany's main industry association, sees the draft spending bill as a tough austerity budget that will be a big burden for the economy and consumers. He agrees with Mr. Dulin that it will make Germany's recovery in 2024 more difficult. The government is trying to prove the doomsayers wrong. On December 11th, the Green Economy Minister Robert Harbeck took a break from the budget negotiations to pay a visit to Verklingen, a city in southwestern Germany. There, the federal government is teaming up with the state of Saarland to finance the transformation of Stahl Holding Saar, a big local steelmaker, into a climate-neutral company. SHS is the third of Germany's four big steel companies to be promised state aid for a green makeover. It could eventually receive 2.6 billion euros in subsidies. But first it awaits its for Derbyshire, which has yet to land under its Christmas tree. Business Digital Protectionism Toko Tok TikTok navigates its way around Indonesia's digital shakedown. 
The more the world's youngsters love TikTok's viral videos, the more their elected elders hate the app. They decry it for supposedly corroding young minds and, worse, for its links to China, home to its parent company ByteDance. Many in America want to ban it. India already has. In October, Indonesia, another big and promising market, shut down TikTok's fledgling but lucrative sideline of selling goods via its videos by requiring social media firms to obtain an e-commerce license with no guarantee of success. Such obstacles have forced TikTok to act strategically, for instance by moving its global headquarters to Singapore and hiring a Singaporean chief executive, which has put distance between it and its Chinese parent. In another canny move, on December 11th, it announced that it was paying $840 million dollars for a 75% stake in Tokopedia, the e-commerce arm of GoTo, an Indonesian tech conglomerate. It has also pledged to invest $1.5 billion in the tie-up. The deal is something of a shotgun marriage, but it benefits both sides. GoTo, which has struggled to turn a profit in recent years, will no longer need to subsidise its loss-making retail arm. TikTok, for its part, will be allowed to restart its e-commerce operations. Sales on TikTok's app will be fulfilled by Tokopedia's logistics network, though, like all e-merchants in Indonesia, it must now charge minimum prices for products made abroad. TikTok and Tokopedia separately account for 10% and 28%, respectively, of Indonesia's fast-growing e-commerce market, according to Momentum Works, a data firm. Together, they are a powerhouse, matching the market share of Shopee, hitherto the country's biggest online emporium, owned by C-Group, a Singaporean technology conglomerate. Most important, an intimate link with a domestic champion makes TikTok look less like a foreign interloper. If the firm can make its new partnership work in the world's fourth most populous country, it could use this as a model for expansion and consolidation in other countries where it is greeted with wariness, such as Malaysia and the Philippines. It will be an uphill struggle, and not just because of challenges particular to TikTok. All over the world, the advocates of international openness in digital commerce are losing the battle for hearts and minds. Last year, C halted its expansion to India in the face of regulatory pressure after its popular mobile game, Free Fire, was banned. Stringent new European rules on cloud computing, including requirements to store local users' data locally, are aimed squarely at the American tech giants. Last month, America, itself in an increasingly isolationist mood, dropped earlier demands to liberalise trade in digital goods and services as part of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework – the already flimsy pact which President Joe Biden's administration has been negotiating with 13 Asian allies. To thrive amid rising protectionism, digital and otherwise, TikTok and its rivals will need to show plenty of delicate diplomatic footwork. Business Bartleby the Art of Delegation How to Entrust Decisions to Subordinates and Not Regret It Delegating well is the six-pack of management, widely desired and harder to achieve the older you get. In theory, handing appropriate decisions off to people lower down the corporate ladder means greater satisfaction all round. Bosses get more time to concentrate on the issues that really deserve their attention. Middle managers and workers enjoy a greater sense of autonomy. And the organisation benefits from faster decision-making on the part of people who are better informed about the matter at hand. In practice, however, delegation is a minefield. Some bosses do not even try to delegate. They may mistrust people below them or crave control. Their career success may simply have persuaded them of their own genius. But there are kinder explanations, too. 
Startup founders are conditioned to do everything, at least until firms get to a certain size. Plenty of managers shoulder more work than they should in order to protect their teams from overload. Other managers do delegate, but they do so for the wrong reasons. Studies suggest that people are likely to hand off decisions when choices are hard, when the consequences affect others, and when they want to avoid being blamed for a bad outcome. In a paper from 2016 by Mary Steffel of Northeastern University and her co-authors, volunteers were told that they had to book hotel rooms at a conference, either for their own use or for their boss, and asked them if they would like to reserve the rooms themselves or delegate the task to an office manager. When they were choosing for the boss and the hotels were ropey, people were more likely to pass the job to the hapless office manager. A new study by Victor Maas and Bei Shi of Amsterdam Business School reaffirms this bleak picture of human motivation. It found that people were more likely to hand work off to subordinates when the performance targets for that particular task were demanding. They were much happier to keep hold of tasks with targets that were easier to attain. If a habitual micromanager unexpectedly asks you to take the lead on something, in other words, run for the hills. The great mass of managers fall into a greyer area. They may be full of good intentions to leave decisions to others, but still find it hard to do so. What if you put trust in your team members, but then discover you violently dislike the choices they make? What if you want to hand over some decisions, but you know that your own bosses will hold you personally responsible for them? These problems can easily result in photonomy, a lip service version of delegation in which managers do not actually leave their teams to get on with things, or underlings use their freedom solely to guess what the bus would like. One way to navigate such problems is to use an explicit decision-making framework that tries to make it clear who is on the hook for what. These frameworks are not perfect. Project managers often use something called the RACI model. Its first two letters sort those who are responsible from those who are accountable, a distinction which normal people may find confusing and incomprehensible. Other, clearer frameworks are available. They have punchy names like Daisy, Dare and Dice. You might be choosing a cloud computing vendor, but you get to feel a little like you're in the special forces. As well as working out who does what, it helps to have a way to parse what kinds of decision can be delegated and what not. Before Jeff Bezos started hanging out in spacesuits and doing laughable photo shoots in Vogue, he liked to articulate his management philosophy in annual letters to Amazon's shareholders. In 2015, he made a useful distinction between Type 1 decisions, or one-way doors, that are important and irreversible, and Type 2 decisions, or two-way doors, that can be reversed if they do not pan out. Type 1 decisions warrant slow, deliberative processes. Type 2 decisions should be taken quickly by smaller groups. Having a theory of decisions improves choices on what to delegate and reduces the chances of regrets. Delegating well requires a lot of judgment, too. Delegation is not all or nothing. A detached boss can be as demotivating as a micromanager. You have to stay informed on decisions and, on occasion, override them. But checking in at the right cadence and letting people proceed with decisions that you would not have made yourself demands self-restraint and discipline. Just like those abs... Business Schumpeter Build bridges, not walls Populist responses to America's border crisis are a threat to nearshoring. Laredo on America's southern border does not look like a crown jewel. The Texan city of 250,000 people appears more like a dusty trading outpost in the middle of nowhere. Sure, it has a quaint centre... Laredo dates back to 1755, making it older than the United States, though for part of its history it was almost as poor and not nearly as much fun as Nuevo Laredo, the Mexican town just across the Rio Grande. 
Yet since the COVID-19 pandemic, it has become a shining symbol of American commerce. This is expected to be the first year when the value of goods passing through Laredo eclipses that of any other port in America, even that of mighty Los Angeles, where stuff is shipped in from China. Laredo's trade is lubricated by axle grease. Every day about 20,000 lorries trundle back and forth across its two trade bridges, transporting everything from cars to chewing gum. Commerce is booming. The value of imports and exports passing through the inland port rose by 8% between January and October year on year. That bucks the trend in other ports such as LA where trade has declined. Because of bilateral trucking restrictions, all that cargo has to be transferred between American and Mexican drivers, requiring 43 million square feet, that's 4 million square metres of warehousing, an area bigger than Manhattan's Central Park. Investment is pouring in. Over the next two years, the city is expected to add another 10 million square feet of warehouse space. It is daunting to think about. The number of lorries is already so large that tailbacks can stretch almost 10 miles, that's 16 kilometres, into Mexico. The explanation for the buzz is nearshoring, which posits that given the risks from overstretched supply chains and the trade war with China, manufacturers should move to North America. Although the potential is huge, so far it is more visible in truck traffic than investment flows. This year, Mexico once again became America's biggest trading partner, overtaking Canada and China. Yet foreign investment into Mexico as a whole, though rising, does not signal a flood of new money. The problem is politics. There is something about border crossings that breeds insanity in elected officials. Instead of keeping the vital arteries unblocked, they favour putting up barriers. Laredo is a case in point. It is an unusual city, with a 95% Hispanic population. Most people, even those who have lived there for generations, speak Spanish. Many residents feel as much cultural affinity with Nuevo Laredo, even though it is plagued by violence, as they do with other parts of America. This came across clearly during a meeting of the Border Trade Alliance, or BTA, a coalition of business executives and local officials in Laredo this month. After greeting each other with Mexican-style abrazos, those present quickly turned to concerns about decisions taken in Austin, Texas's state capital, and Washington, D.C., that were thwarting the free flow of goods. Hector Serna, the BTA's treasurer, says knee-jerk policies related to illegal migration have hit the supply of vegetables to American supermarkets, Corona beer to distributors, car parts to companies like General Motors and Nissan and refrigerators to firms like Whirlpool. It's self-inflicted pain, he says. Travel to the Columbia Solidarity Bridge on the outskirts of Laredo and you see what he means. Built in preparation for the start of the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, in 1994, it was once called the Bridge to Nowhere because there was no highway on the Mexican side. Now it is a flourishing transit point for avocados, cherry tomatoes and other goods from Mexico. Yet the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, wants to strong-arm Mexico to do more to halt the wave of migrants trying to enter America. Under his orders, a state law enforcement agency is imposing random safety checks on vehicles that have already passed US customs, creating long queues. The result is spoilage and ruined just-in-time delivery schedules. The costs are passed on to consumers. The border crisis has led to other counterproductive policies – BTA delegates complained that Customs and Border Protection, an American federal agency, has responded to the surge of asylum seekers by temporarily closing international bridges to free up manpower to process asylum claims. This forces shippers to wait or divert cargoes elsewhere. 
Logistics executives worry that hot-button issues such as illegal migration and fentanyl will take centre stage during next year's presidential election in America, causing further trade-disrupting demagoguery. No one yet knows whether Donald Trump, the most likely Republican contender and wall builder in chief, will proceed with his ruinous plan to slap a 10% levy on all imports to America. But by 2026, whoever leads the government will oversee a sexennial review of the USMCA, an update to NAFTA signed by America, Canada and Mexico in 2020. Given its importance to the trio's economies, it will probably survive. But opponents to free trade with Mexico, such as Florida's fruit growers, are already lobbying for a trade war. The threats to cross-border trade are, of course, not just American-made. Andrés Manuel López Obrador, the Mexican president, has committed his own act of sabotage by imposing state control over the energy industry, which discourages firms from relocating to Mexico. He has militarised the border, putting oversight of trade into the hands of soldiers with little customs experience. Lawlessness is another hindrance. Yet in America, the border is a perennially touchy subject. Those far away see it as a place of chaos and crisis. Those who live near it think that if only it were managed with more sensitivity, the result would be more trade and a regulated flow of guest workers to ease labour shortages. Testament to their optimism is Laredo's love of bridges. It hopes shortly to increase the number from four to five, with a new trade bridge built by a public-private partnership. Mexico has given the green light, but officials in Washington are stalling on permit approval. There, the focus is squarely on walls.